Welcome to Dorsey and Whitney's webinar on crunch time in litigation, keeping an eye on the appeal. I'd like to introduce Tim Drosky of counsel in Dorsey's appellate group. Tim. Thank you, Sean. And thank you everyone for coming to today's CLE. My name is Tim Drosky and I'm the co-chair of the appellate practice group here at Dorsey. Uh, I'll start with a few housekeeping measures and then introduce uh, the panel of speakers that we have today. Today's program is 60 minutes long. Uh, materials and the attendance form are available for download from Dorsey's reminder email, which was sent from events at dorsey.com. And you can return your completed attendance form to attendance at dorsey.com. Uh, the format of today's CLE is going to be that of a panel discussion. Uh, to the extent that uh, any of you uh, watching the CLE have questions that come up, feel free to submit your questions using the chat function. Time permitting, we will try to answer your questions at the end of the presentation. And if we don't have time for that uh, and aren't able to get to your question, you are welcome to contact any of us or call your trusted Dorsey contact uh, with those questions. So with that, I'd like to introduce today's panel of speakers. Uh, I'll start with Jennifer Coates. Jennifer is a partner in the Minneapolis Trial Group and is also a member of the Appellate Practice Group. She has extensive litigation and trial experience representing corporations and government entities in complex civil litigation matters. Jennifer has also defended corporations and government entities in commercial litigation and has significant trial and appellate experience. Jennifer's recent cases include products liability with a focus on automotive and medical device. Her toxic tort practice focuses on asbestos litigation across the country. And in addition, she has extensive regulatory ex expertise. In terms of Jennifer's appellate experience, she recently was the appellate counsel uh, sitting in on a multi-week products liability trial uh, with uh, that was a multi-million dollars at stake. And she has also been involved in 30 different, more than 30 different appeals in the Minnesota state courts, as well as appeals in the Eighth Circuit. Next, Skip DeRocher is a partner in the regulatory affairs and trial departments of Dorsey. Skip has been at Dorsey since 1990 and has been co-head of the firm's Minneapolis office since 2016. Skip practice, practices in the area of complex commercial litigation with a principal focus on three areas, insurance coverage on behalf of policyholders, representation of financial institutions with respect to consumer credit and related claims, and federal Indian law. As part of his practice in these areas, Skip has handled appeals in seven of the federal circuit courts of appeal and has also appeared before three different state Supreme Courts and numerous tribal courts of appeals. Finally, Justice Lang is of counsel in our Dallas office and comes to Dorsey after serving for over 16 years on the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals in Dallas. While on the court, Justice Lang authored more than 2,100 opinions and participated in more than 6,100 case decisions. During that same period, Justice Lang served for six years as a member of the Texas Multidistrict Litigation Panel and as chair of the Texas Commission on Judicial Conduct. He now offers extensive litigation and appellate experience and expertise to clients. So thank you to our panelists and thank you to everyone here for uh, coming to today's CLE. To start things off, um, this, the topic that we're talking about today crunch time and litigation and keeping an eye on an appeal throughout the course of the case is a timely one. Uh, just last week, law.com issued an article uh, with what it called its litigation trend, spatter, trend spotter. And the trend that law.com identified was as follows. And this is a quote from the article. Appellate lawyers are increasingly being brought into cases long before any appeals are filed in an effort to better anticipate and prepare for how litigation might play out post verdict. And the law.com litigation trend spotter article identified as the driver for this trend that if ever there was a time to shake up the makeup of the traditional trial team, it appears to be right now, you know, as we're still in the midst of COVID or starting to come out of COVID. And so, what I thought I'd do to start out our discussion today is just ask each of our three panelists here. Um, from their perspective as litigators, as former justices on the appellate court, as both trial attorneys and appellate attorneys, their perspective on this trend, the driver, and, and their thoughts on that subject. So I'll start with, with Doug. I don't know if you, what are your thoughts on this subject? Well, I think that there's a broad 
uh, spectrum that one needs to look at uh, from when the cause of action accrues, as they say, or when the deal blows up, all the way through to the end, the, the final appeal. Uh, my, in my experience on the bench, that's what I saw. I saw the record uh, from the beginning uh, all the way through to the point where I was sitting and trying to determine whether there was error in the trial court. So there are key points along the way that uh, one should stand back and look at. The trial lawyers are working very hard to get the discovery done, tee things up so they can go to trial. And it, it uh, in my view, would be helpful to have somebody there available to help them look at the pivotal issues. Uh, while they're moving quickly, one can uh, stand back and take a little time to contemplate the issue. Well, thanks, Doug. And Jennifer, I know that just this past summer, you were in the position of being the appellate lawyer that's described here, uh, sitting in uh, as the appellate um, eyes and ears of the case uh, during a multi-week jury trial. I don't know if you can speak to the speak to the trend and the and the driver and your experience in that in that case. Um, absolutely. I, the trial was venued here in Minnesota in Ramsey County, which is uh, where St. Paul, the capital of Minnesota, uh, sits. And I think one of the most significant uh, aspects of me being brought in was I was brought in as appellate counsel at each stage of the pre-trial phase. So um, from the motions in limine to even the jury study. I was part of the jury study and how the case was going to be presented, the ideas, the, the themes, um, and ultimately the litigation strategy. And, you know, what that set up um, a good basis for was, you know, obviously a good relation, working relationship with trial counsel, uh, who was uh, from a different law firm. But also, I was able to, you know, let them know which appellate issues I was spotting right off the bat. And so we weren't necessarily waiting for, um, you know, the day we pick a jury to determine, you know, what our appellate strategy needed to be and, and the things that we needed to look out for and maybe things that we needed to add or subtract um, in order to have a strong appellate uh, case. Well, thank you, Jennifer. And Skip, do you have any thoughts on the subject? Well, Tim, you know I do. Uh, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a trial lawyer at Dorsey, and I'm not part of the appellate uh, uh, practice group, uh, although I've, I've done many, many appeals uh, in both, uh, well, and I guess in, in state, federal, and in tribal court. Uh, uh, but uh, despite the, the fact that I, I've got a fair amount of appellate experience, I, I don't consider myself a, a per se appellate lawyer. And uh, I think I have I've, I've been a fan of this trend uh, maybe before it became a, a trend, um, uh, particularly in my Indian law cases. I've, I've always felt that uh, I, it was helpful for me to get one of our appellate lawyers involved early on in the cases, uh, particularly, uh, again, uh, with the, the Indian law uh, cases, because there's all, uh, not always, but many times jurisdictional uh, issues and constitutional issues. And, uh, and, and I think Getting, getting someone with sort of just that appellate focus uh, involved early on helps me sort of formulate my, my claims, uh, uh, be very specific about what I'm, uh, I'm alleging in my complaint and how I focus my discovery. So, uh, so I've, I've oftentimes in my, my Indian law cases, I've included appellate counsel uh, early on, and I, you know, now that I hear that this is indeed a trend, I, I plan to to expand this and 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 include appellate counsel in in some of my other cases as well. well thanks, Skip. So this next slide shows kind of the timeline of a case, and and obviously the appeal is at the very end of it. Um, but what we're hoping to talk about today is how each step along the way. There are things that can be thought about in terms of the ultimate appeal strategy, things to be, to be, to be considered in terms of global case strategy, and, um, and that at, at each step, there might also be different um, off-ramps to the appeal. Uh, Doug, I, I know you've kind of you know, formulated this kind of way of thinking about a case. I don't know if you have any thoughts, big picture that you'd like to share now before we 
for the rest of the program start marching through the different parts of the timeline of the case. Yeah, uh, thank you, Tim. Um, I do. Uh, this really follows on what I uh, was uh, offering up a minute ago. You've got, as Tim said, many different on ramps. They're critical points that you have to look at. Uh, before the lawsuit is filed, uh, well, you and I worked on something recently where a, an attorney general's opinion was requested. Uh, it was clearly a request that was going to be adverse to one of our clients, and we responded to it. Well, that's pre-litigation. We don't know if there will be litigation, but we were getting ready for it, so we knew what the issues are. Uh, and I think as, as one goes through uh, all those different phases, as you said, there are many opportunities to consider where are we? What has the trial court decided? Have, has the trial court made a discretionary decision that is adverse and could likely affect the outcome of the case in a negative way? And one of the things that we'll talk about later, I know, is uh, uh, mandamus. Mandamus is simply uh, a course correction opportunity if, to uh, go to the appellate court and uh, assert to the appellate court that the trial court abused her discretion and there is no adequate remedy by appeal. If you let that go all the way to the end, it may be error, but you may have uh, suffered for it along the way, including an adverse judgment. Well, thank you, Doug. So we're going to start by talking about the global case strategy, which is something that um, like you identified, Doug, you need to be thinking about early on and can really stretch throughout the entire case. And that global case strategy can take on a number of different components. Um, Pre-litigation strategy before the lawsuit's even filed is, is certainly you know, uh, the first step in that. Uh, Jennifer, I know you spoke about being involved in pre-trial filings. Do you also have thoughts on, before the lawsuit's even filed, um, some of the pre-litigation strategy from an appellate perspective that should be kept in mind? Um, absolutely. I think that the way there's a there's a few things you you had on your last slide some off ramps um, at different stages in the litigation. And so you know when we are responding to a complaint, you know we certainly want to be paying attention to whether or not we're filing a motion to dismiss, whether or not we are. Um, uh, I guess with whether or not we need counterclaims, um, whether or not there are other parties uh, that need to be pulled into the litigation. Um, from the perspective of, you know, even looking at a lawsuit to begin with, um, you really want to make sure you're in the right jurisdiction. Uh, you want to make sure um, that you are uh, in you also want to make sure you're you're choosing between federal and state court appropriately. Sometimes people miss the opportunity to file in federal court um, when they when they and that's where they prefer to be. Um, you also want to think about overall cost uh, for the case. I know for many clients, at the end of the day, this is really about a business decision. So if we're if we're thinking about setting up a claim for appeal, we want to make sure it's streamlined and in, in as good a position um, to make sure that the issues are really targeted. Um, and, and that takes a lot of work up front. That's, you know, sitting down with the client, um, going through documents, understanding ultimately what the best case business outcome is understanding whether or not you're making your you could make bad law in a jurisdiction if you proceed. Um, those are all considerations uh, before you even sit down and, and draft the complaint. And so um, I really encourage people to understand the you know jurisdiction not only whether or not there's you know personal jurisdiction um, or subject matter jurisdiction, but also whether or not this is a jurisdiction where you want to disturb the law uh, that you are. Uh, you know, essentially um, advocating for in your position. Thanks, Jennifer. And, and Doug, I know you had just mentioned that you've been involved in some pre-litigation but adversarial dealings. I don't know if you have any, any additional thoughts on the pre-litigation -litig strategy, especially looking ahead to a potential appeal. There is always uh, a reason to sit down and, and consider with the client and your colleagues where you're going. Because if you don't know, we have to start out, where are we? And if you aren't sure where you are, you're not going to be able to point in some direction to dispose of 
of the uh, liability. And as Jennifer said, it's all about business decisions. You want to determine how you're going to conduct uh, uh, conduct you know litigation. How you're going to deal with exposure. So it, it's it's sit down, talk about it, figure out what you want, and then if you do get sued. You know, as a friend of mine uh, said many years ago, do you want the cheese or get out of the trap? Which means you want to settle this thing probably or try it if you can't settle it. Well, thank you. And, uh, and Skip, I, I know Jennifer had talked a lot about jurisdictional type decisions going into the pre-litigation strategy. I know that's something that you deal with a lot, particularly in your federal Indian law practice. I, I don't know if you have any, any additional thoughts on those kind of jurisdictional decisions that you make at the onset of a case? Sure. First, first I have to congratulate Doug on his, uh, his, his saying, you know, I, I expect the, all Texas lawyers to have a good, a few good sayings like <laughs> that. Uh, you know, I think, I think the one I'd heard before was that, you know, that dog won't hunt, but, uh, but I'll have to remember the cheese and trap one now. So thank you. Actually, Doug. I, I learned that in Iowa where I grew up. So <laughs> fair enough. Well, uh, yeah, with respect to your question, Tim, you're, you're right. Uh, uh, jurisdiction plays a role in a lot of my my tribal cases uh, from a whole variety of different uh, you know avenues. There, uh, what, you know, first, we, we, a lot of times we have to decide whether we're going to be filing in tribal court, state court, or federal court, and uh, and then looking beyond what's going to happen in that trial uh, trial court level. Uh, what's going on in the courts of appeals in those jurisdictions. So, uh, you know, uh, sometimes in, in tribal matters, uh, tribal court's not an option. And uh, then we're looking at state versus federal. And we'll look to the, uh, the appellate uh, uh, rulings from those jurisdictions to, to try to help guide uh, our, our even, you know, where we're going to, to file that initial, initial case. Um, Similarly, you know, the, the, another issue again in the, on the tribal context is, uh, you know, sometimes we have the option of, of Washington D.C. and and I suppose anyone with any sort of federal practice uh, might have that option, uh, as opposed to filing within, you know, federal court within the state where your client is located or where the the, the matter arose. Uh, you oftentimes can look to. Uh, what's going on in the District of Columbia uh, or the D.C. Circuit, and what the rulings are there on the substantive issues, or, or you know, perhaps politically, uh, uh, you know, what kind of claim this is and where it might fare fare better. So, uh, particularly in my tribal practice, we we look very closely at, at jurisdiction and uh, try to figure out what's going on with those courts of appeals. Well, and one other thing that's come up already in the discussion is how even when settlement is the likely off ramp for a lot of these cases, there's still a benefit in having an appellate focused attorney involved in, in early kind of global case strategy. And, you know, that's something that can arise uniquely in the class action context where you, a single defendant might be sued in multiple jurisdictions by based, you know, with similar claims, but um, uh, from varied plaintiffs. And, and Skip, I know you've had experience in that. I don't know if that's something that you can speak to in terms of where looking at, at, at the appeal can can have can, can alter the, the course of settlement. Yeah, and 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 particularly, uh, you know, the, in fact, a, a case that you and I handled together uh, a few years back involving class actions and forced placed insurance, um, and uh, we had lawsuits filed against our client around the country in different uh, federal courts in, in uh, different locations, and uh, and and. So you, you've got to look at both, you know, within each of those jurisdictions where you're sued, uh, what, what, how are you going to fare on the merits, uh, not just at the district court, but at the, the court of appeals, and and we had to to look at that to then decide how quickly do we uh, to move forward in some of those cases versus others, because obviously you want to you want to have the the faster moving cases perhaps be the ones where uh, yeah, you're going to fare better, but at the same time, I, I know in those cases. We also had to look at, uh, the, you know, the possibility of settlement and uh, uh, a, a big issue a lot of times in uh, class action settlements is is whether you can uh, you can settle uh, on a claims made basis uh, where, you know, the the consumer uh, who's a part of the class uh, would have to if there is a class certified uh, uh, 
the consumer would have to take some affirmative action in order to submit a claim. And typically, uh, you don't have as, as broad a participation in a claims made settlement. But one of the things you have to look at then is how do the uh, how are claims made settlements uh, handled and uh, and and uh, are they favored or disfavored in a particular jurisdiction? So at the same time, you're looking at the merits uh, of of a class action and where you might fare best. Uh, you also have to be thinking about settlement and where uh, 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 which jurisdiction might or might not uh, allow a claims made settlement. So. Uh, hopefully you can match up uh, a jurisdiction where both of those things, uh, you know, work in your client's favor. Thanks, Skip. And one other thing that needs to be thought about in terms of global case strategy is, is I think, you know, most attorneys are familiar with the final judgment rule and, and the notion that the general principle is that you get one chance to appeal and that's after the entire case has been litigated. But um, there are different off ramps to a, to, to, er, to earlier disposition by the Court of Appeals, at least on certain issues that can come up. And, and Doug, I, I know you at least you know, referenced mandamus already. I don't know if you, if you have anything else you wanna add a little bit on this bullet point. I know it's one that'll come up throughout the rest of the presentation as well. Sure, uh, uh, preliminary injunctions. Uh, of, of course, in competition cases or, or uh, many other types of things, uh, uh, you, can, uh, you can appeal uh, the denial of a preliminary injunction in federal court and most state courts I know of, uh, uh, or the granting of a preliminary injunction. And the interesting approach uh, is to uh, a party loses uh, the preliminary injunction hearing, which is, you know, pretty much throw all the evidence in and uh, try to get the court to rule uh, as a matter of law that you're entitled to that injunction and it may bode well for you down the line towards the final uh, trial. But, uh, you know, if you, if you lose at that point, uh, you can appeal to the circuit. And uh, we had a recent situation where uh, the party on the other side lost the preliminary injunction. And while the case was being move forward and set for trial on the merits in the trial court, uh, the Sixth Circuit uh, was teeing up, uh, getting ready to uh, see our appellate briefs. Of course, what they did was invoke mediation at that point, which is one way to handle it. So that off-ramp of going up to the circuit was uh, uh, actually um, taken off the track, as a matter of fact. Hmm. Oh, Skip, you're on mute. Doug, do you mind if I ask you a quick question on that? Uh, no. you, 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 uh, you know, I heard you say the Sixth Circuit and mediation, and I had a, a, a similar experience, and as long as we're talking about appellate practice here, no. I was actually doing an oral argument at the Sixth Circuit where one of the judges asked whether the parties had engaged in mediation and uh, during the oral argument. <laughs> and then at the uh, before the end of the oral argument, strongly encouraged the parties to go back to the, the Sixth Circuit's mediation uh, 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 system. Did, is that how it came up with you as well? Well, no, actually uh, it was the notice of appeal was filed and uh, uh, it could be, it could be, but I don't know that the appellate court and the trial court got together and looked at the, uh, what was going on and said, we need to see if this will not settle. Uh, that kind of, kind of comment from the bench on an appellate matter, uh, in my experience is not uh, terribly unusual because uh, <laughs> we, we did it on occasion uh, well, where you, know, you really had a really tough uh, case and uh, probably neither side was gonna like the result that the appellate court came up with. Right. Uh, I would also say the preliminary injunctions uh, uh, appealing the grant or denial, uh, an appellate court is not going to be tremendously enthusiastic about hearing that because uh, the, the facts may change by the time you get to trial on the merits. And, and that's probably one thing that was going through the mind of, uh, of the people 
calling the shots at the appellate court and the trial court. You know, the, the, a lot of times somebody, uh, the party will want what is effectively uh, an advisory opinion. And uh, the, the appellate courts are not going to do that. They're going to just decide whether the trial court abused its discretion and there's uh, uh, irreparable injury. It's a strategic choice. Mm -hmm. Well, then the last issue we have here, you know, it, it it's often heard, you know, with, with appeals, you need to be concerned about issue preservation, issue preservation, but what exactly that means or, or when you need to start thinking about that uh, is, is always something that um, I think is worth discussing. Uh, Jennifer, I don't know if you have any thoughts on uh, early preservation of appellate arguments and that, how that kind of fits into the global case mm -hmm. strategy. You know, I think that all litigation matters are very dynamic and that they're constantly changing and metamorphosing into different issues. And so one of the reasons I think that appellate counsel should be brought in early is so that it's part of that change, um, understands why the changes have been made. Um, you know, when you're appellate counsel as opposed to trial counsel, and I, I've been both, um, I think that you you think to yourself in trial, like, I'm not going to sit here and object to every single thing this person says. I'm not going to bring a motion to every, you know, um, time that to that somebody violates the rules. That's just not a very good strategic choice. It's also incredibly expensive for our clients. Instead, what's really important to do is to narrow down um, how do we want to move forward and how can we get more leverage by making certain choices? And so when you're thinking about early preservation of appellate arguments, it's the same way that you think about how you're going to try the case ultimately. Um, you know, what those issues are going to be, what you wanna focus in on, um, because you'd never wanna be perceived as someone that is coming into court and saying, you know, I'm gonna throw everything up into the air and everything that lands on the table we're just gonna go ahead and, and argue about. Um, you need to be really much more strategic than that um, in how you're preserving your um, uh, appellate arguments. So the things that I suggest are bring your appellate attorneys into all of the expert um, you know, conversations, decisions, um, you know, give them copies of the depositions, um, you know, bring them in early for the uh, Daubert or Fry Mac motions. I mean, you, you really want to make sure because that those tend to be some of the, the hotter issues that really can have a case overturned or, or um, you know, or, or have a case go your way as far as uh, settlement. The other thing you want to think about are preservation of discovery issues. So, you know, if you're not getting the discovery that you need in order to defend or advocate uh, for your client, um, you need to think about which motions you want to bring and what do you want to focus on. So at the end of the day, if you needed, you know, a piece of that jigsaw puzzle evidence, um, you know, to prove your case in front of a jury, but you never brought it up as, you know, an issue that they weren't turning over the evidence, now you've waived that you know, essentially that issue and you have to either try to deal with it on the fly uh, during trial, you know, but most of the time it's going to be past you. So I think appellate counsel is really good, you know, to bring in at each stages of the big you know, pockets of litigation, you know, uh, you know, when you're talking about discovery motions, when you're talking about expert motions, um, and when you're talking about dispositive motions like summary judgment. Well, and another thing that can come up right now is, you know, there's a lot of talk in the press, uh, about the new U.S. Supreme Court, you know, and, and the supermajority that's there, uh, its new composition, and the Supreme Court is granting certiorari on more uh, on more issues that are expressly saying, should we overrule this past precedent? And you know, early on in the case, if you're not preserving that argument, even if that's not what the law is, to the extent some of those issues might be percolating their way up to the court, and that could be the cert grant that happens next term, right? Um, and you're involved in multi-year litigation, you know, preserving some of those arguments now, even if the current lay of the land isn't one where it'd be a winner, um, knowing some of those can, can be effective so you can benefit from those rulings uh, to the extent they might come up later on. You know, Tim, what, one thing if I can add, uh, it, it, it occurred to me while Jennifer was, was talking and, and it goes back to something that's in our handwritten uh, materials that are gonna get sent out. Uh, I think Doug Doug had put that it put that in there that if it's not written down it didn't happen or something along those lines and you know one thing that I think is is really helpful and I, and I always wish I'd do be better at this is keeping sort of an appellate log during your case because 
Uh, you know, especially when you've got a case that's going over an extended number of years, you get rulings along the way, uh, issues that come up. And, you know, at the time you're like, boy, I, I got to remember that one for appeal. And uh, I think to have a working appellate outline from the very beginning, I know you and I are working on, on one right now where we're trying to recreate some of the issues that took place three, four years ago and some of the orders, the early orders. Uh, I think it really is helpful to have, uh, you know, one of the documents that you is kind of a working document is this uh, appellate issues that you keep track of throughout the case. You know, oh, that's great I, advice. I'd like to just add uh, uh, to what Skip's saying because that's an excellent point. Um, in our materials, there is a long list, uh, a checklist that uh, really one needs to go through every time they're they're starting a case uh, because uh, one of the words used uh, and we chose in that checklist is this is a list of gotchas if you don't do it you're going to be in trouble uh, and it depends on the case i think uh, uh, one of the the you know most uh, interesting and important books that i've read in the last couple of years was uh, by a surgeon in Boston, Atul Gawande. He wrote the checklist manifesto, how to get things right. And, and the point is, even surgeons who have done a procedure thousands of times need to have a checklist. Airplane uh, pilots have a checklist. That's why you see them out there kicking the tires uh, as you're sitting in your seat. So a checklist, for trial lawyers uh, with the assistance of an appellate lawyer is gonna keep you on course and allow you to preserve those uh, appellate arguments. Great point. Um, so the first kind of stage of the litigation where uh, you know, you're actively engaged in the fight now and, and having an appellate focused practitioner can be of value is dispositive motion practice. And, and Skip, you know, I, I know you had talked about kind of a, at a global case strategy standpoint, thinking about jurisdiction. What about once you've chosen your jurisdiction and the other side's fighting it or, or vice versa? Um, when you're actually in the thick of the fight in the district court, do you find value in just having the trial team or, or, or is there value in having an appellate lawyer involved in that as well? Yeah, I think even even before uh, you get into the the actual fight and you're anticipating the fight, I think it's helpful to have that appellate focus. Uh, and again, I'll I'll revert back to my my tribal practice because because that's what's kind of most uh, fresh in my mind right now. But I think it it um, it carries over, spills over to other areas of practice as well. But an example would be in the in the tribal practice. Uh, if I want to sue in tribal court, uh, the general rule is. A tribe, a tribal court doesn't have jurisdiction over a non-member of the tribe, but there are exceptions to that. And one of the exceptions is if that non-member has entered into a consensual agreement uh, with the Indian tribe or a tribal member, then the tribal court may have a jurisdiction. Um, but there's always this focus on what happened on the tribal land or what might impact or affect the tribal land. And so you got to be thinking about that um, because ultimately that decision of whether there's jurisdiction or not can not only be tested in tribal appellate court, but it can also be carried over into federal court and then go up the federal court of appeals ladder as well, to make a determination of whether there in fact is jurisdiction over that non-member. So, so I, I, I found it very helpful to make sure that I understand not only what the tribal appellate courts are saying about when they have jurisdiction or how they have jurisdiction, but the carryover to the federal courts. And so if I'm in the Ninth Circuit, what's the Ninth Circuit's rule <clears throat> on that consensual uh, relationship and what, you know, what we have to, to prove and make sure we have those allegations in the complaint uh, right from the very beginning and that we don't go further than what we need to allege because sometimes that can have repercussions as well. So having an appellate counsel or having that, that focus on What's going to happen as we go up the ladder uh, with that jurisdictional analysis is very helpful, even as I'm just framing my uh, my initial complaint, and then of course as we uh, as we move forward in briefing. Mm -hmm. well, well, and sometimes jurisdictional or, or immunity type decisions can go right to the right to the appellate courts right away as well. You know, if it's the 
if it's found that jurisdiction does not exist by the district court, well, then you're off to the court of appeals and, you know, and, and people who have uh, litigation practice that deals with immunities, whether that's the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act or, you know, qualified immunity is a little bit different in the 1983 context, but, but those are going to be early determinations that win or lose are going to go up to the court of appeals right away, as opposed to waiting for final, for final judgment. And so, um, and so there can be value in having, it, it makes for a, for an easier transition if you don't need to bring bring the appellate lawyer up to speed um, once you're in the in the court of appeals but if you can ha have done it early on um, you know constitutional claims issues of statutory interpretation you know those are clear issues of law that are ultimately going to get decided by the court of appeals um, Doug I don't know if you have any insights in terms of when those are being litigated in the district court in the in the value of thinking ahead to the appeal sure um, well first of all constitutional claims I think it uh, you really got to sit down and figure out what you have is is uh, uh, the is the claim based upon statutory interpretation? Is the statute the kind of statute that uh, facial is facially invalid? That is, any application of it is unconstitutional for a number of reasons. Or is it just that it is improper to apply? apply that in this situation on a constitutional basis. When you get to the constitutional issue, the question is, is there real injury to this plaintiff or to the defendant perhaps in a counterclaim? Or is this just speculation? Is this just uh, a guess? Is the claim ripe? All of those things are you know, classic language, but they have premise to it that you really uh, uh, must address because the trial court addresses it regardless of what happens. It's gonna probably go up if it's a big time constitutional claim. And then the Court of, uh, the court of Appeals has to make a determination. Uh, you know, is, is there an abuse of discretion as a matter of law, is the court wrong? This is groundwork that must be done early on. Well, and, you know, particularly when those kind of claims come up in the preliminary injunction context, it, it can go all, all the way upstairs quickly. Um, you know, I know you spoke about fact intensive preliminary injunctions, the court often wanting to put push those down. But, you know, you know, there are lawyers at the firm who have been involved in preemption challenges that were brought on a preliminary injunction basis. And the U.S. Supreme Court granted certiori and, and heard the case based on just that preliminary injunction record. Um, and so thinking about how you're framing those arguments right away, but also the supporting record that you need to have there, because that's going to be the record on appeal is also critical in terms of legislative history, boots on the ground. How does this play out? Um, how is this impacting the different litigants and the parties? Um, those are all decisions that are going to be need to make that are going to be need to be made up front and can carry on throughout the entire case. Um, class certification is another issue where, you know, you know, they're dispositive motions. Um, often the class is certified, it'll often settle instead of instead of ever going to trial. And if the class isn't certified, the case manages to disappear pretty, pretty quietly. <laughs> and so Skip, I know you've been involved in a number of these kind of cases. Um, and there's also a possibility of, of those kind of class certification decisions going up on appeal. I, I don't know if you're able to speak to that a little bit in your experience. You bet. Yeah, no. Uh, yeah, there's a federal rule, uh, 23F, that does allow a party who loses a motion for class certification uh, to petition the Court of Appeals for discretionary interlocutory review. So the minute that decision is made at the trial court, you can seek uh, review by the, the Court of Appeals. Uh, and, the, you know, the federal courts have identified various grounds for when they're going to grant uh, uh, review. Um, and they each have a little bit different uh, uh, grounds uh, that they consider, but generally, I think there's probably three that the courts look at. Uh, first, will the the issue, the class cert issue that they'd be addressing, will that resolve you know fundamental and unsettled issues of class action procedure? So, uh, if you're able to to demonstrate uh, that, uh, you're going to increase your likelihood of of getting your your uh, matter heard right away. Uh, there's the so-called death knell situations, and uh, the death knell situations are typically, as you sort of indicated, if the individual claim is so small 
Uh, so the you know the, the the class reps claim is so small that if cert is denied, the case is likely not going to proceed. It's not it's going to just go away. Uh, or the, the reverse death knell, which is if the case is so big that if cert is granted, the defendant's likely going to have no choice but to to try to settle the case uh, early on. So that's another uh, you know area that death knell situation is another area that the court will consider when deciding whether to grant uh, cert in a class action. On an, interlocutory, an interlocutory basis. And then the third uh, typical one is manifest error. If you can demonstrate manifest error by that trial court uh, with respect to the class certification. But, you know, but, but so, so you can certainly make those assessments, uh, you know, look at your circuit, see what the precise rule is and make your assessment as to whether, you know, it's likely uh, that, the cl- that the court would, would take cert. Um, but, uh, but there's there's other things that you have to consider as well. Uh, you know, how often does the Court of Appeals grant review? Um, how long does it take the Court of Appeals to decide whether to grant review or deny review? Uh, because your case may pr- keep proceeding down below uh, while this uh, you know the, the class certification issues is going up on appeal. And uh, and if the petition is granted, does that mean that the order is likely to be reversed? And you know, I, I think what you're seeing nowadays, and I think there's a lot of a lot of lawyers are out there uh, doing statistical analyses within each of the circuits to uh, to say, okay, in the Ninth Circuit, uh, we know this many are uh, you know class certs uh, are are taken up on review uh, interlocutorily, and of that X number have been uh, reversed. So people are kind of trying to turn this more into a, I think more of a science than an art, but uh, certainly. Uh, it is an issue that uh, you need to look at right away uh, when uh, when the trial court either grants or denies cert. Hmm. I'm sorry, well, God, think, denies cert. Well, I think also the the legal issues that are going to be of interest to the court of appeals are always going to be inextricably intertwined with the facts of the case, oh, yeah. um, whether that's a Spokio standing issue, um, whether the you know plaintiffs have been injured, whether that's a predominance issue, and so having someone who who is able to, you know, be aware of the legal issues that might be of interest to, to the court, but also making sure that the record evidence is in the trial court record that the court of appeals can then consider is, is critical, um, and, and to make sure that those pieces are talking to each other. Um, and so, of course, you know, one of the main areas of dispositive motion practice is summary judgment, which is in, in some ways kind of the preview of the appellate brief that may be in the future. Jennifer, I don't know if you want to give some insights. Uh, into that stage of the proceeding and involving appellate counsel. Oh, absolutely. I think summary judgment is, you know, by that time, certainly the people know where they stand um, and whether or not, you know, how strong their case is. The case is basically, you know, in. Um, And I think at that point, appellate counsel is so important to be able to say, you know, based on how we're constructing these briefs, you know, which issues we're we're going to need to focus on um, and, and how you want that package to look. Because if you, you know, are granted or denied summary judgment, depending, um, and you you look to appeal, um, you know, that summary judgment order, um, you need that argument laid out with a bow for the appellate court. You don't want the appellate court to have to go through and create its own um, interpretation of the record. Your motion for summary judgment should provide a really nice roadmap uh, for the Court of Appeals um, to to look at the issues and and specifically which issue and part of that issue you're talking about. When you're talking about appealing summary judgment orders, you're obviously talking about something that is um, going to be a high stakes litigation. This is not your run of the mill, you know, fine, you know, we've done these a hundred times and we're going to appeal each one of them. You know, if you're looking to appeal a summary judgment order, it's because either A, you know, in that jurisdiction, this law is going to be bad for you and your industry client going forward. B, um, you don't, you want to shut down these lawsuits. So strategically, you want to make sure that you have room in, you know, if other lawsuits are brought or brought in other jurisdictions, you, you, you want to have those issues crystallized. Um, and three, you know, to talk about, you know, what is going to be allowed in if there is subsequent litigation, um, you know, as far as experts, as far as discovery, as far as evidence, that kind of thing. You, you, you need to have that crystallized for you. And so there's a lot of strategic reasons why you want to bring 
bring appellate counsel in. Um, and that is really to clarify those issues at that summary judgment stage so that, you know, it, it seems like an extra expense. But, you know, in fact, um, there's a couple of things appellate lawyers bring. One, um, unlike the, you know, tri trial lawyers that are also part of the team, the appellate lawyers, you know, are often, I think, have more of an academic perspective um, at that point in the litigation. And, and by that, I just mean, you know, my heart and soul is not, you know, on the ground because I have lost this motion for summary judgment. I am not quite as in a punchy mood when I'm uh, when I have my appellate hat on as opposed to my trial hat on. I think those are just very different positions. Um, and so your appellate counsel, I think, often can let you see through that haze of, um, you know, when we're litigating or trying a case, um, we're you know, we have a uh, certain investment. Um, and I think appellate counsel really does, you know, help everybody, you know, figure out uh, what their positions are and how they want to move forward. And, and often has some of that emotion, um, uh, you know, at the door. And I say all that as I'm talking to litigators and I feel terrible, but I am, I am on your side too, litigators and trial lawyers. You just wear a little bit, I think of a different hat sometimes in the appellate role. Thanks, you know, Jennifer. I just add to that. I mean, before I went on the bench, I tried a lot of lawsuits, so I understand exactly what you're talking about. And uh, but you know, the difference between the position of the trial lawyer, moving fast, getting things done, going to getting ready for trial, and the uh, uh, appellate lawyer who can stand back and assist, as you're saying, is is very uh, much comparable to the position of the trial judge compared to the appellate judge. The trial judge, as we used to say, is they're calling the balls and strikes. They got to make fast decisions. The appellate judge gets the opportunity to consider it, to look at the whole record uh, and, and hopefully uh, dispose of the case in a reasonable period of time by an opinion. Uh, but so that, that's the difference, but they're all part of the system. Right. And I think, you know, to add to that, you know, the idea that the, um, you know, often when we're, people are doing motions for summary judgment, you know, I always hope that I have enough time and enough bandwidth to, you know, give it, you know, 100%. And, and certainly that is what we all try to do. But when I partner with an appellate counsel, you know, on these issues, sometimes they come in and say, oh, no, that's not your strongest argument. You want to make a different argument. Um, because on appeal or going forward, this is what this argument, this is how it plays out. Um, and, and, and in that way, I think it's an incredibly valuable uh, member of the team uh, to have to make sure, again, that you're making the best arguments you can, you know, for them with the economy of time that you have. Um, well, thanks. Good value added. Good value added. Well, while the dispositive motion practice might be kind of a more obvious time to involve uh, appellate counsel, expert issues, discovery issues might not come uh, front to mind in that respect, but, but is an area where, where appellate counsel can still be value, valuable. Doug, I don't know if you have some perspective on where where you've seen that as a possibility. Yeah, well, let, let's talk about discovery first. Uh, assume for a moment that a party wants uh, all documents of the opponent from the beginning of time, uh, and the uh, uh, and and you simply say, "Look, we can't give you all of our documents from the beginning of time because the the issue." doesn't relate to uh, you know, more than 20, the last 20 years. But the trial court says, uh, well, I'm just gonna let them go in there and search around. It, 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 it essentially, you have a fishing exposition looking for uh, things. Uh, that's where you make a decision. Uh, do you just stay with that, give them everything uh, because you think there's probably nothing there? Uh, and it is irrelevant, or at that point, do you seek mandamus? Mandamus is nothing more than uh, asking the appellate court to tell the trial court, uh, you abused your discretion. You need to change this right now. Uh, and I can say having uh, reviewed hundreds of those cases uh, over my years, uh, it it is, 
you know, most mandamus petitions are denied. In federal court, uh, federal courts don't appear to like mandamus, that is the appellate courts. But you have to really make a strategic decision. Am I gonna live with this order, which could turn on me and really bite me or not? Uh, expert issues as well. Uh, you know, the uh, classic Daubert motion, um, you, you all will see and have seen uh, the expert who has credentials uh, rolled out uh, and are extraordinary credentials, but the expert does not connect the dots and says, I believe this is what I believe about this and just take my word for it. Ipsy Dixit is the uh, classic term. And uh, you can't let that go. You can't let it go. And if you believe that they are addressing all the integral issues up to causation, you have to stand your ground. Uh, trial courts deal with those all the time uh, and they write opinions on them. But it's, it's critical strategy on both of these points to take a look at it, look at what happens in the long run uh, uh, and, and decide how it strategically could affect your case. Well, thanks. Well, we are getting tighter on time. So we have about you know eight minutes left. Um, I think it's good that we spent the amount of time we have on these subjects because we're now starting to move into areas where I think it starts to, the light bulb starts to go off on, on people's minds already. Oh, not, now is maybe the time to be starting to involve appellate counsel if you haven't already. But um, I think it's important that we spend time on, on the trial itself. Um, you know, there are a number of different aspects to trial. Um, it, it's, you know, it, it's, it comes at a pace like, like nothing else in litigation. Jennifer, I thought maybe we just start with you since you've been through this experience recently. Um, I know you touched on it a little bit earlier, but do you have any other insights in terms of the value you were able to add and, um, and the advantage to having an appellate minded lawyer there in the courtroom during the trial? Oh, absolutely. Well, first, uh, on motions and limine, when you have appellate counsel in the room, I'm keeping track of every motion and limine and any anything that comes in that may violate one of those motions and limine. So um, you know, often we we do MILs and then we're in the middle of trial and we may forget, you know, one or two or three <laughs> different of the rulings and we just let things go. Um, and as an appellate attorney, it's your job to, you know, pay attention to them and say, you know, we're not going to just let you know, we're not opening the door, we're not going to allow you to use this evidence. And, you know, often I'm in the back of the courtroom, you know, making lists, uh, checking things off, um, and saying, you know, at lunchtime, or at the lunch break, we're going to bring this up at the court, and let the court know that, you know, they violated this motion eliminate x, y, and z, this is the relief that we're seeking, um, and so on and so forth. So that's incredibly important. Jury instructions are things I think are often forgotten about, uh, you know, people just sometimes they will just throw them together thinking, oh, it's not that big a deal. I think find your instructions to be an incredibly important piece um, because you're really laying out, you know, what it is that you're asking the jury to do during trial. And you want to make sure that the um, that the instructions line up with your overall trial strategy um, and fit in with what is possible on appeal. Um, and so, you know, I, I have spent, you know, two, three weeks sometimes just going over jury instructions over and over and over again, um, just to make sure that they are in the right place that they need to be. Um, as far as issue preservation, I think that the biggest concern there is getting your trial attorney to object. And sometimes you have to be creative. Um, sometimes, you know, you say, well, can you make a standing objection as opposed to objecting every time somebody, um, you know, brings something up? You, as trial attorneys, we don't want to object a lot in front of a jury because we don't want the jury to think necessarily that we're hiding something. But at the same time, as an appellate attorney, you know, you want to make sure that you're poking someone and saying, hey, we've got to we've got to put something on the record here um, and then making sure that the court rules on that objection um, is, is incredibly important. So, you know, as somebody who's just come out of trial, I think that, you know, as as the appellate counsel, I think it's just critical that you have a really good working relationship 
relationship with trial counsel as the appellate counsel, um, and then to make sure that issues are being preserved um, in, in one way or the other. Because if you don't say anything, Court of Appeals is going to say, you know, that you, you waived it. The other thing I think is really critical is to have some kind of brief writing uh, that can be done during trial. So you have bench memos, um, you know, or for, for the for the court to look at the issues that you're objecting to um, so that they the court has some basis by which to rule. And a lot of that is educating the judge um, and your appellate attorney can be a wonderful partner in that. Well, thanks, Jennifer. And Skip, I'm curious, your perspective as a trial attorney, you know, I know you've been in trials have, <laughs> and, and have had to think about these kind of issues. And then, and then also after trial, you have the post-trial motions. I don't know if you can kind of speak to your, to your experience. Yeah, no, and, and Jennifer's exactly right. You know, it's always this balance of how soon, you know, do you have to make that objection right away? How explicit does it have to be? And, uh, you know, the, the one example I, I think of is a, a number of years ago, I had a, a state court a jury trial in, in California, and it got to the, the verdict came in, and the, the court is reading the verdict, and it turns out there's inconsistent verdicts uh, between two of the claims. They just can't, they, the jury could not have reached those two conclusions. And the problem was by objecting, I was possibly going to be having the judge send the case back to the jury after six weeks of trial to re-deliberate. And if they deliberated and came out the wrong way, it would cost my client $60 million. So it was a big debate. Uh, we ended up rolling the dice and going the right way. We, we preserved the argument for appeal. We objected just enough uh, to preserve it. The court did not send the case back to the jury. Uh, it, there was a judgment against our client. We took it up on appeal and reversed it. Uh, because we were able to preserve that objection during the when the verdict was rendered. And, and do you have any perspective then after after the after the jury trial after the verdict when you're looking at post trial motions uh, in terms of incorporating appellate counsel at that stage? Were you asking me, Tim or Doug? Yep. Okay. Uh, well, yep. either either one, but I'll start. I'll just say. I hate post-trial motions. Uh, you know, you, you either want to go out and celebrate or you want to go out and, uh, you know, drink yourself to despair because you've <laughs> lost. And instead, you've got to start working on those post-trial motions right away. So uh, they're, they're horrible things to do. They're an they're uh, evil necessity, though. And, uh, uh, you know, what I guess I'd like to ask Doug, his view on is how much do you throw into those post-trial motions? How much do you throw into a, an appeal you know, it seems like there's always this if you raise every issue and, and you know that could possibly come up uh, or do you really focus in on just the key major issues and uh, I always struggle with that and I'd like to hear what Doug's thoughts are yeah and we'll, and we'll need about the we'll need the 30 second version <laughs> <laughs> okay 30 second version is uh, what rulings of the trial court or what issues uh, are harmful because that's going to be what drives the appellate issues uh, yeah, the trial court could be wrong, could have abused her discretion, but did it uh, uh, likely affect the outcome of the suit to, to cause a, an adverse result, which is uh, critical in any case. Uh, you know, when I was early in my practice trying lawsuits, I thought, well, that judge made about 20 uh, errors today. I wonder if that's uh, reversible. Well, they weren't, you know. Uh, <laughs> So it, it and, and the record preservation very quickly offers of proof. Uh, most jurisdictions are going to say if you don't offer your proof, if, if if proof has been excluded by the trial court, if you don't offer it into the record before the jury retires, you cannot preserve that. At least it's that way in in this part of the world uh, where I am. Uh, and and the judge may say, oh, we'll just take that up later and you'll make your record after uh after the jury goes out too late do it timely just like making timely objections well thanks doug and thanks to all of our panelists today um it, it's one o'clock so we'll wrap up here but um you know I, I hope i hope what the presentation has um shown is that when it comes to looking at the appeal a stitch in time can save nine and that when you're looking at things like issue preservation thinking about those considerations from the very inception all the way uh, of the case can help make sure that there are arguments you can raise on appeal. Same things when you have that key piece of evidence that you either need in the case or need it out at trial. 
uh, thinking about those record preservation issues early can help. And that even if this is a case that you're hoping will ultimately settle, thinking about the appellate precedent, uh, the circuits that you're in, making bad law, do you want a precedential decision out of this or not, all of those kind of things can impact settlement posture and when you maybe try to take that uh, settlement off ramp, if that's what you're considering as well. So thank you very much, everyone who uh, joined us today. We don't have any time for any questions, but feel free to reach out to any of us or again, any of your other Dorsey contacts if there's anything you'd like to follow up on. Thank you very much.